Okay, thanks for joining uh, us for our conversation with Carl Zinsmeister. Us, there is me, Mike Hartman, a co-editor of The Giving Review, uh, and Dan Schmidt, uh, a mentor of mine from when we worked at the Bradley Foundation and one of my two co-editors of The Giving Review. Carl yeah. Zinsmeister uh, is a lot of things, and we're going to list three, Carl, and let people... Uh, click on a link in the piece introducing this post to see what the rest of them are. But uh, he's uh, author of a new historical novel called The Brothers, uh, a true life saga of the remarkable family who made America free. Uh, Carl has also in, in his life been a vice president of the Philanthropy Roundtable uh, and was the chief domestic policy advisor to President George W. Bush. Uh, Again, among very many other things, which we can uh, get you familiar with if you if you click on some of the links in the piece. Uh, what gave you the idea to write this novel, Carl? Well, uh, in the years prior, I had been working on a big, big kind of magnum opus that ended up being a thirteen hundred page book about kind of the history and purposes of American private giving, private action. And as most of our listeners know, I think that's always been a really distinctive part of the success of our country. I mean, Tocqueville and others very early on said, wow, all this stuff that in Europe would have to be solved by a government, the Americans just take care of themselves. They figure out how to fix these things on their own. So I worked for, oh gosh, really half a decade or more on this big, thick book that became a standard reference. It was very inspired to learn a lot of the stories about these incredible men and women who who did things with their own funds and their own energy to make the country better. And during that time, I discovered these two brothers, Arthur and Lewis Tappan. And I immediately was thinking, why don't I know about these guys? Because very quickly I could conclude that they were maybe the most important transformers of culture in our country. And uh, that is, I hope some of our listeners might agree, is ultimately more important than transforming politics or transforming the economy or something else. Culture is deep. Culture is upstream from an awful lot of other things. So these guys were just brilliant at that. And uh, like I said, I was very surprised that I didn't know about them. So I dug in and and uh, figured out that um, they, they probably are most famous, as the subtitle of my book implies, for making America free, by which I mean they were the guys that really turned abolitionism, the abolition of slavery, from what, when they started, was a really kind of a fringy, not very well thought of movement into a mass popular crusade, really almost unstoppable. And it was really their work that did that. But they also did all this incredible other stuff through philanthropy. They um, they were huge builders of schools and colleges and educators. They, they uh, had a lot to do with the fact that when they started, only half of the kids in the country had any, any schooling, any literacy. And by the end of their lives, that, that was almost 100 percent. They were very instrumental in knocking down substance abuse, which is really out of control in Jacksonian America. F three or four times our current levels of alcohol use. You can imagine what that translated to socially. And the Tappans helped through the temperance movement, helped knock that down by about 70 percent. They eliminated a lot of poverty. They did all kinds of wonderful things. Sex trafficking, you would never have guessed early in our country. Huge problem. And the, the, the Tappans attacked it. And so they had these amazing effects and made a lot of enemies in the process, mind you, which we can get into. But I was just astonished. And I started thinking about why have they not shown up on our history books when there's some good reasons for that. First of all, they were Puritans, literally. I mean, they grew up in the house that Jonathan Edwards, the famous you know fire, fireballing preacher, lived in when he lived in Northampton, Massachusetts. So very strong Puritan backgrounds in New England. They uh, they went to um, New York City and became extremely successful Wall Street merchants. So they were rich business guys. So, um, you know, you got this kind of problematic background in, in modern terms. They were dead white European males with religious fervor and Wall Street connections. And who wants to make them heroes, right? Well, I'm sorry, but these guys were who they were and we really need to understand them. So um, I dug in and I quickly realized, Mike and Dan, that I was considering doing this as a novel first of all the um again back to the fact that these were 19th century men they were puritans they didn't emote all right they didn't they didn't you know do flashy things at all so i was worried that for contemporary minds it would be hard to bring them to life and then what really pushed me over the edge was that i discovered a third brother so arthur and lewis are these famous humanitarians evangelicals businessmen very moderate kind generous men they had this eldest brother named benjamin 
who, first of all, was the most brilliant of the group. I mean, he, everything he touched turned to gold. He, he studied painting with Gilbert Stewart, you know, the famous painter of Washington. He uh, built clocks by hand. He translated Voltaire from French to English. So he was just an amazing mind, even maybe more talented than his amazing brothers. But he also had a completely opposite disposition. They were religious, humanitarian, you know, good citizens, wanted to help the society around them. They were moderate in politics. He was a crazy uh, radical Democrat, Jacksonian Democrat. He couldn't stand people. He was an incredible curmudgeon. He ran off to the frontier basically to get away from people as a young man and um, and went to these incredible wilderness adventures that I recreate in the book and then became a combative trial lawyer out there. Again, just the opposite of what Arthur and Lewis did, but again, hugely successful. He was basically uh, the guy who got Andrew Jackson elected by swinging Ohio in his favor. And then Benjamin himself became a U.S. senator, went on to like, for instance, found he, he was really important in founding the Smithsonian Institution. He was a very important uh, scientist in himself, but uh, could not have been more different than his brother. So when I realized this, I thought, oh, that's biblical. That's Shakespearean drama almost inherently. And at first, the brothers were absolute source points. They were on opposite sides of every public issue. And this was a time when that could be death, life and death. I mean, the, the Tappan brothers' lives were threatened many times by the allies of their brother, Benjamin. But somehow these guys managed to keep loving each other. And they wrote these heartfelt letters that I've read in the Library of Congress. You know, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong about this, that, and the other. Can't wait to see you and, you know, give my love to your wife. So I thought to myself, wow, there's a lesson for this in, in, in this for contemporary Americans. Can we disagree without hating each other? And then in the final denouement at the end of the book, and again, I didn't make this up. This is what really happened in real life. They, I don't want to spoil the ending, but these two polar opposites on this question of slavery and lots of other things ended up as close collaborators and very important in bringing Lincoln into the picture. So the, the whole story went full circle. So that's when I realized I probably should write this as an historical novel and try to really you know, bring it to life as a human story. Yeah. Uh, the Benjamin. Uh, tell me how unfair this is, especially after you cited the Bible and Shakespeare, right? I want to drag you down into the mud of current. <laughs> Sounds to me as if all three brothers would be considered conservative the way we think of it. Uh, but Benjamin may be a little more populist given the Jacksonianness, or is it unfair to try to read into the three brothers? Or, or the two and the one, as it were, uh, those types of political categorizations. And if it's not unfair, and we can, what might that mm -hmm. tell us about conservatism, I guess, or, and, and, and how mm -hmm. that which gave rise to Trump could perhaps be handled, either in the philanthropic sphere or any other. But uh, I kind of like Benjamin. Uh, <laughs> is that okay? Yeah. Really, I guess That's my question. <laughs> I'm actually thrilled to hear that because I, I think he's, he's fascinating and he is constructive. I mean, it's really hard to translate them into modern terms. I'm not I'm, I'm not even sure I'm going to try, but I, I do want to underline that they just could not have been further apart. And there were multiple attempts on the lives of his brothers. There were attempts to kidnap his brothers and drag them into the South where they would face grand juries or be hung. And Benjamin was, while that was going on, was literally, you know, slapping backs and having supper with John Calhoun and Andy Jackson and the people who were fomenting this hatred toward the Northern abolitionists. So, uh, you know, I, I, I just couldn't quite understand how they managed not to just be at each other's throats. And I think it's a real tribute to the whole idea of discussion and of, you know, open speech. That's the one thing they were, they were both in, a, all, that both parties were in agreement on. They were radically like, you do not shut down other Americans. That's not what this country is built on. And that was in a really important piece of common ground. So that prevented them both from squelching each other, but more importantly, it became a place where they ultimately objected to the slaveocrats because the slaveocrats were not only keeping African-Americans in oppression, but toward the end, just before the war, they were taking away all kinds of human rights. They were shutting down newspapers. They were lynching people. They were trying to prevent people of all races and all dispositions from exercising their American freedoms. So this became really the common ground between the brothers. And I think this could become the common ground between the, you know, the next reconciliation this country needs. If we can agree that it's poisonous when you start saying that guys who have different points of view are evil and that you need to keep dialogue open and you need to let people say things without attacking them on an ad hominem way. That's a, that's, that's, that's an encouraging avenue, I think, for us today. 
Carl, you, I, the, I, I'm going to go to Benjamin as well. Uh, there's uh, read, read through, like Mike, uh, not all of it word for word. Uh, but uh, there was one letter in particular, Benjamin, I think, wrote to Lewis, which struck my, uh, for, for various reasons, got my attention. And uh, one of the issues they brought up there was actually immigration and uh, uh, thinking about uh, why people cross the sea. And uh, mm -hmm. I guess my question would be, and, and it's sort of an interesting response, they cross the sea to have life their own way and not necessarily for material purposes. Of course, a lot of the discussion today on both sides, but mostly certainly on, on uh, the non-conservative side with respect to whether it's philanthropy or public policy, or whatever, is that, well, it's about jobs and the importance thing and therefore equating material success, at, le at least on one level. And here we have Benjamin in his letter, uh, talking about uh, uh, it's having the life your own way and therefore assuming yeah. a sort of credo underneath it all, a sort of understanding of life, which uh, of course doesn't exclude material considerations, yeah. but uh, things rise above. So I was wondering if uh, it, 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 to have you have your point of view on this with respect to maybe relating it to philanthropy, how uh, uh, these three who did see things in a common way really gravitated toward that morality issue that other than success in business, success in politics, uh, what about that morality piece? And it, was there are there one or two incidents in the book or in their lives that you'd say this points to a commonality, uh, which, as you just concluded your own remarks here, uh, can show people the the way, the open open the door for the bright light. Yeah, that's very interesting, Dan. Yeah, um, there's a lot there. The um, I was even surprised when I was researching this to discover this. A lot of the book is set in the really nastiest slum in New York City ever, which is a place called Five Points. And it was mostly Irish, but a lot of other immigrants and poor people as well. And I cannot begin to communicate the level of squalor. I and mean, we're talking about something that just puts any contemporary slum in the, in the pale. People were living in basements on the straw. They were drunk all the time. There was amazing levels of violence. It, it was a horrible place. And yet, People who walked the streets of Five Points said there was also a certain joviality and joy to vive and life in this place. I thought, how can this be? And a lot of it is what you've just discussed, that it isn't economics alone that define whether somebody is happy or successful or or feeling like they have some purpose in life. That, that for instance, a lot of those Irish immigrants came from even more miserable physical circumstances where they were living off of potatoes and nothing else in these tiny little uh, plots that could barely support their families. And when they came to the U.S., they didn't have much more economically, but they did have liberty. They did have some freedom. They did have the ability to, to shape their lives. And that ended up being really important. Now, the, the genius of the philanthropy that the two philanthropic brothers, Arthur and Lewis, took up was exactly this point you're making, which is that man is not defined by bread alone. They did not believe in just giving people things. They didn't believe that was the main thing that was missing. They said the main thing that's, that's missing in unhappy lives is a, a, is a compass, is a, a sense of moral purpose, is a sense of meaning and, and dignity. So that's where they put their emphasis. And a lot of what they did was really aimed at building character and competence in, in poor and struggling and unhappy people rather than giving them stuff. And in fact, they realized that stuff can get in the way of the really necessary reforms. So, you know, it, it really was so radically different than so much of what we see today. I mean, the word moral almost has this negative connotation today, you know, this, this old fashioned fusty comment connotation. Boy, it didn't for the Tappan brothers. They thought that, that you, if you weren't pursuing moral ends when you're trying to help people, you'd very soon either become a Lord of the Manor who thought too much of himself, or you'd condescend to other people, or you'd face other temptations. So, so they, they really felt like this is something you do because your faith calls you to it. You do it as an equal with the other person. Obviously, you, you're not better just because you're the giver and they're the receiver. And you also put obligations on them. You don't just give them things. You expect them to rise to the occasion. You ask them to do hard stuff. You ask them to become a giver themselves. So the Tappans were very explicit. We really want you to start going to church. We want you to get a job. We want you to take care of your family. We're not just going to uh, you know, give you without things without conditions. We, we expect you to make yourself a better citizen and human being. Well, in a way, Carl, would you say they, they transcend, in a way, their Puritanism? Uh, that they see your point earlier in your, in your setup for Mike and myself uh, on, the, on the novel, that uh, culture uh, and the importance of culture, and then through that transcendence, 
in a way, these three, uh, looking at the novel ourselves, the way we both read it, that there's a transcendence here, uh, and therefore, uh, associating with Lincoln, uh, even though the two brothers were more, that there, there is a vision that uh, explains in a way, not just philanthropy and the importance of giving and what it can do for moral discipline and also joy and happiness for others apart from yourself and giving, but also mm -hmm. transcending for society a way of uh, addressing things, which again, might step a little bit outside people's ordinary or normal or accepted understanding of Puritanism. No question. Uh, the, the brothers were very explicit that they were kind of pioneering a new form of Calvinism. It was called the New Light version. And their parents and grandparents' Calvinism was very severe. And there wasn't a lot you could do to change your 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 life course under that vision. You know, you kind of got anointed you or didn't, and you 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 sort of had to live with that. The brothers completely rejected that. And not just the brothers, they were part of the so-called second great awakening. And for any of our listeners who aren't familiar with the Second Great Awakening, I really encourage you to dig in. It's absolutely fascinating. And our first Great Awakening, which a lot of historians will tell you gave birth to our revolution, was the whole idea of equality, that every person is a child of God and no one has the right to order another person's life and blah, blah, blah. Very, very important in the growth and development of our nation. But the Second Great Awakening, which happened about 50 years later in Jacksonian era, was completely different. The, the notion there was, you not only can, but must change your soul, improve yourself, lift yourself to, onto a higher plane, that this is possible, that God wants you to do it. God will help you do it. Your fellow Christians and your fellow citizens will help you do it. So again, you're, you're absolutely right, Dan, completely different understanding than this kind of gloomier Calvinist predestination understanding of their grandparents. And it drove everything they did. They did not believe there was such a thing as a lost case. I mean, they were realistic. They were, these were not utopians you know the brothers were very realistic and they understood that some of these illiterate people they were working with and some of these freed slaves that had been so badly battered by life and and other people were were going to have traumas and struggles in their lives but they felt like they had an equal right to to be happy and an equal chance really if they would if they would make the right moves and that's all the brothers wanted to do was to kind of give them a, a, a chance and to give them the tools that they needed to be equipped with